how's the sound? Is that okay for everybody? Good. All right, wonderful. Uh, well, welcome everybody to tonight's event, which is entitled Corruption in New Zealand. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here along with uh, our distinguished guests from tonight who are, uh, I would say, major figures in the struggle against corruption here in this jurisdiction. Um, we have first Julie Reed, uh, who is the director of the Serious Frauds Office. And uh, before, in a prior incarnation at ASIC, she was responsible for the investigation and litigation against the Australian Wheat Board uh, that paid bribes to Saddam Hussein under the Oil for Food program, which is, I think, an interesting tidbit. Um, Marty uh, here, Marty Robinson, is a AML lawyer, which is anti-money laundering lawyer, as well as a criminal lawyer and author of, oh yes, a recently released book from LexisNexis entitled The Anti-Money Laundering Regime, A Practical Guide, uh, just, what, a month ago? July. July, okay, so quite recent and quite relevant. As Marty will explain, there have been a number of changes recently to New Zealand legislation on this, on this point. Uh, my name's Tim Kuhner, by the way. Uh, I'm an associate professor here uh, specializing in law of democracy issues. And uh, it's my job to introduce tonight's event with some reflections on uh, why it's important. Uh, in terms of arriving at the first reason why it's important, I should tell you uh, something that you probably already know, which is that New Zealand has an excellent reputation when it comes to anti-corruption. Uh, in the 2016 Transparency International Index, New Zealand was uh, tied for number one along with Denmark, if I'm not mistaken. But you'll be glad to know in 2017, New Zealand pulled ahead to first place, edging Denmark, at Denmark am I right? Uh, edging Denmark out by one point, but still uh, beyond that, significantly ahead of other Scandinavian countries and Switzerland too. Uh, so Norway, Finland, Switzerland are looking enviously uh, towards New Zealand. Um, now, uh, this is not obviously this corruption perceptions index from Transparency International is not a perfect measurement by any stretch of the imagination, but the countries that are at the top of this measurement are at the top of most other measurements as well. And the countries that are at the bottom of this tool are also at the bottom of most other indices. So it does give you a ballpark view of what we know about corruption, which again is an imperfect universe. Um, so that brings me to the first reason why I think tonight's event is interesting is we can learn something about what country number one in anti-corruption is doing right. Uh, we can explore what New Zealand is doing in its regulatory environment to address corruption. And that is a significant case internationally because of its standing uh, at the top. Uh, now, having said that, New Zealand's score on this index is an 89 out of a possible 100. So to be at the top, you only need to get a B plus. Uh, no country is presently receiving even an A minus. Um, furthermore, uh, just last week, Transparency International uh, put out a press release stating that New Zealand needs to increase its efforts to fight foreign bribery, citing a lack of improvement since 2015 when similar concerns were voiced before. Additionally, a 2017 review of New Zealand pursuant to the United Nations Convention Against Corruption pointed out key weaknesses in terms of bribery being defined too narrowly, facilitation payments being allowed, and insufficient provisions in the laws addressing trading and influence, illicit enrichment and embezzlement. So concern coming from uh, Vienna and the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime and the countries that were reviewing New Zealand as part of the, the review mechanism there. So the second reason that I think tonight's event is important is that we might also be poised to learn something about what New Zealand could do better and to not be complacent in sort of resting on uh, your laurels here in, in this country. Uh, the third reason that I think tonight's event is important is the broadest one of all, and um, it's well conveyed actually by the situation affecting my home country under the presidency of John, Donald J, J. Trump. See, I can't even say his name. It's, it's sort of, it's, for an anti-corruption person, it's, it's just like chewing on some unsavory morsel that you need to spit out. Uh, so what I think Trump's case illustrates, among other things, is that a pretty well-established democracy, arguably an advanced democracy, can fail pretty easily without more robust controls uh, for corruption. Now, unfortunately, the case of Trump, of an, an illiberal, authoritarian, 
uh, populist on the far right isn't an isolated case. Uh, actually, there's similar trajectories, as you probably know, in Poland, in India, in Italy, in Austria, uh, Turkey, Hungary. Uh, so we are at a time in history when people's frustration, uh, political scientists tend to be establishing that uh, the election of, of far-right populists flows in part from reasonable frustration with economic and political systems, specifically corruption. Now, the irony there is that voters who are frustrated with corruption are tending to elect governments and candidates who bring only worse forms of corruption to bear on the very system that, that they've uh, voiced frustration with. So uh, in the case of Donald Trump, this promise to drain the swamp uh, really seems like uh, instead he's flooding it and starting to charge admission. So um, as you may have, let me just say a little bit about that. As you may have already heard, uh, Trump owns many corporations operating around the globe. He's richer, even when you equalize the, the money in today's dollars, he's richer than all prior US presidents combined. Uh, despite those things, he's failed to release his tax returns or divest himself from his companies. And of course, he's appointed family members to key posts. Now, uh, shortly after spending $66 million of his own money to get elected, he proclaimed that the president can't have a conflict of interest and that the law is entirely on his side. He then went on to appoint an exclusive group in millionaire, of millionaires and billionaires to cabinet positions. Uh, notably, these cabinet positions are responsible for policies in the areas of trade, environmental protection, commerce, agriculture, education, uh, and energy, in which all of these cabinet uh, positions, these individuals, have personal financial stakes. So they apparently, like the president, are incapable of having a conflict of interest. Or if they do have a conflict of interest and they're steering US policy towards their own bottom line and their investments in their prior companies that they used to run, uh, even if they do have those conflict of, conflicts of interest, they aren't actionable under the law. So um, anyhow, and now we're in the middle of this Paul Manafort thing where uh, it, it comes out that, of course, the man who volunteered to head Trump's campaign for free at the time was indebted to the tune of $17 million to pro-Russian oligarchs and quite skilled at laundering money, um, which is perhaps a damning detail in terms of the special counsel's investigation into Vladimir Putin's successful attempt to influence the results of the 2016 election. So um, I would say to have an American introduce an event about corruption is perhaps similar to having an Italian introduce an event about Dante's Inferno. Um, <laughs> And it's not that we invent, Americans invented corruption or that Italians invented epic uh, poetry. It's just that Trump and Dante are leading cases in those respective categories. Um, and, and I don't bring up Dante's Inferno, though the, the eighth circle of hell is reserved for the fraudulent and the malicious. I don't bring up Dante's Inferno as a suggestion for how punishments for corruption could be upped. Uh, that would be a bit cruel and unusual. Uh, but I would note, I think it's interesting that the Barriters, these corrupt politicians who trafficked in public offices, languished in lakes of boiling tar in the eighth circle of hell. I think it's interesting that the counselors of fraud in that same eighth circle burned inside plumes of flame like spirits swathed in confining fire. Similarly, the falsifiers and the counterfeiters lay about thirsty, filthy, dark, and, and screaming, afflicted by terrible diseases, for they themselves were a disease upon society. Uh, Dante conveys these underlying ideas of what corruption is, actually a disease upon society. But again, those punishments today would violate prohibitions on cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, the reason that I'm really closing with Dante here is that the inferno uh, is a part of a three-part journey, right? It's part of a three-part journey towards God. Not just Dante's journey, but an allegory for the soul's journey towards God. Now, uh, why am I saying this? To begin to get to the highest reaches of creation, Dante begins down below, right? Recognizing, <laughs> condemning, and exposing this, well, the various circles of hell, including those who, who end up there because of corruption. Now, most of us here today aren't here out of some sort of religious journey to get to God. But there is an analogy here, which is that we are part of a journey towards some lofty goals of our own, uh, which include the integrity of economic and political systems, uh, a journey towards prosperity and self-governance, 
for all people regardless of class, regardless of wealth, regardless of political and economic connections. And so also, in today's world of authoritarian populism, this is a journey to save democracy and to save capitalism and to see if they can be reformed and survive the 21st century. So I do think our guests tonight are part of a very broad issue beyond simply what New Zealand is doing right and what New Zealand uh, yeah, could do better. I think they're part of a much bigger issue, which is the survival of democracy and capitalism and whether those systems can endure. So um, I don't think I'm alone tonight in that conviction. Uh, and I think that this is why, this context is why we're especially fortunate to have Julie Reed and Marty Robinson as two figures, prominent figures in anti-corruption law here with us tonight. So uh, Julie and Marty will both have about 25 minutes to speak without interruption. And then there will be time for comments and questions when they're finished. Uh, so with that, uh, I give you Julie Reed, the chief executive and the director of the Serious Frauds office. Thanks very much, Tim, for your introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak here this evening. Um, I can see some people in the audience who are intimidating me on the, on the left here, so um, <laughs> some who will know a lot more about New Zealand law than I do, um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm Australian um, and I've been here for the last five years as Director and Chief Executive of the Serious Fraud Office. I've got a few slides that I just want to romp through that, to tell you a bit about what we do um, for those who may not know too much about us. Um, and I'll start with those and get on to some more substantive stuff. So the scope and role of the SFO, we were formed under the Serious Fraud Office Act of 1990 and um, we were modelled on the UK Serious Fraud Office which was established about five years <coughs> before us, I think. Uh, we detect investigate and prosecute serious or complex fraud. Um, we do have both functions, which is quite unusual in the common law world. Um, but in prosecuting, we have a panel of counsel, so external counsel who assist us with the prosecution. So we do have that independent prosecutorial perspective on things. Um, we have some criteria for investigation, which I've listed there. They come from Section 8 of the SFO Act. We obviously have um, internally a, a much more um, nuanced set of um, criteria that fall, but they fall under these four headings of scale, public in interest, complexity and the nature and consequences. And one of those of particular interest tonight is that we see corruption as particularly important to our jurisdiction and we did actually prosecute um, one person for offering a council planning officer $1,000 in a brown paper bag. Um, we lost that prosecution, interestingly, because um, the judge found that there were cultural reasons why the um, defendant thought that that was appropriate and therefore he didn't have the appropriate mens rea. Um, this is very quickly our organisational structure. Um, I'm the director and chief executive. Chief executive is a public service title. Director is my title under the legislation. <coughs> I have a general counsel who is speaking at a lecture tomorrow here, um, Paul O'Neill, who's a, an alumni of this institution and he's a very good general counsel. So um, if you're interested in some slightly more technical perspectives than I'll give you tonight, um, I'd encourage you to come tomorrow if you're, if you're able. Uh, we have three teams, evaluation and intelligence, um, business services and investigation, and as you can see, the vast majority of our resources are operational. Um, you'll also see in the bottom part of the screen that we get over 700 complaints a year and of those only about 14 or 16 make it to inve full investigations. That's because we get a whole lot of stuff that's just not serious enough. Um, we refer them to other agencies. They don't constitute fraud at all. Some, we have a number of vexatious complainants who like to write to us on a regular basis just in case we're getting lonely. <laughs> um, we have a strategic plan which you can find on our website and I'm not going to stay to talk about that, although obviously it includes corruption. In terms of New Zealand's corruption um, context, 
as Tim has mentioned already, in 2017, New Zealand was number one. Um, actually, New Zealand has held the number one place, either alone or with others, on the index 13 times, more than any other country. Our nearest competitor in this regard is Denmark, which has been at number one 10 times, followed by Finland with six. So we're actually quite a long way ahead in that respect, in just in the sheer number of times that we've been up there. Um, we've performed significantly better than our fi fellow Five Eyes countries. Does everyone know what I mean by that? Yeah, sorry. It's sort of come into common parlance, but <laughs> I'm not absolutely sure. Um, so with Canada, it's the only other Five Eyes country that has ranked within the top five, and they've done that five times, but the remaining Five Eyes countries of Australia, um, United States and the UK have never ranked in the top five. So it's quite... <coughs> You know, it's quite a long way ahead in terms of the Corruption Perception Index. Um, and of course, the interest in corruption is not new. The index goes back to about 1995, I think. Transparency International was formed in 1993 and first published their index in 1995. Um, long prior to that, though, the US um, created their Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. That was 1977. Um, it sat there for almost 20 years before anyone did anything with it, which is a really interesting thing. But um, obviously some time ago, bribes to secure business or to speed up transactions were just seen as a necessary evil of doing business, particularly in emerging markets. Um, now there's a commercially star-studded list of defendants who've been caught in the net of investigations, particularly by the UK and the US. Um, and Interestingly, interest was first sparked in America in um, corruption and particularly foreign corruption when they started to appreciate the economic interests of um, US businesses were being damaged by corruption in these developing economies because they, their, com their companies were being beaten to contracts by people who were prepared to pay bribes. And so they realised that there was an economic imperative for the US to start enforcing their Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So as I said, approximately 20 years after its enactment, the FCPA started to be used. And at about the same time, the OECD Convention came into existence, uh, the Foreign Bribery Convention for short, and the UNCAC um, Convention came into operation in 2000. Um, one of the things that's obvious about the perceptions index, and as Tim has already mentioned, is that it's just perceptions. Um, there's approximately 16 indices, so it's actually just an index of indices. So they don't do original research themselves. They take, they can aggregate a whole lot of indices and come up with their index. There are about 16 um, separate indices that are used, but not every country is ranked by all of those indices. Um, New Zealand is ranked in a approximately eight, and the maximum that any country is ranked under is 10. Interestingly also, the indices that New Zealand is ranked in are the indices where the top countries are ranked. So if you're in that index, you've got a better chance of getting up to the top is the basic story. Um, so how has all this, in, this interest in corruption over the last 20 odd years affected New Zealand? You know, we've traded on our reputation as a high integrity market for at least since the first TI index was released in 1995 when we were ranked one. Um, and even if we wanted to back away now from that, and I don't think we do, the anti-corruption movement has gained so much momentum that, and enormous political support that it's, it would be impossible, as, especially unilaterally, to walk away from the TI index or indeed the, the two conventions. Um, we've now ratified the two conventions and that's why um, New Zealand has only just been assessed under UNCAC because we only um, ratified that legislation recently. New Zealand has a policy of not ratifying conventions, um, although they're signed at the start. They don't ratify until we consider our law is compliant. So there's a whole lot of other countries who ratify immediately <coughs> and then become compliant. And so while New Zealand was criticised for quite some time for not having ratified UNCAC, um, United Nations Convention Against Corruption, um, that was because we felt that we couldn't comply. So I, I don't think that that's actually inappropriate but or, or a matter for criticism. 
but obviously, nonetheless, we've signed, we believe we comply, but the, the standards keep getting ratcheted up. So every time they have a round of reviews, they'll look at different things and come up with some different standards that everyone's looking for. Um, there's no doubt that we are at risk of corruption. We are trading in different parts of the world than we used to, um, whereas we were focused on the Commonwealth countries, Australia and the UK in particular. Um, we trade far more widely in China and other countries which are subject to much greater risk of corruption. Um, and the pressure of these um, assessments and so on has also led to the decision to implement the second tranche of AML, which Marty is going to tell you about because I know nothing. Um, and that will, I think, have a significant effect on local businesses, so I'll be interested to hear about that. So our corruption risks, we think one of the biggest risks to New Zealand is um, at the complacency in addressing corruption. I've no doubt that we do experience less corruption here than in many countries of the world. However, despite some recent strengthening of our laws in relation to corruption, the reality is that we rely on willing compliance. So we have a cultural um, compliance with anti-corruption laws. But you know, those societal norms are going to be very much diluted by the enormous diversity in immigration that we're getting. And we're having many people come in, like the man who paid $1,000 in a paper bag to a planning officer, who don't understand that that's not acceptable here. And they will, that will mean that those norms will <coughs> be diluted and we can't just rely on people to willingly comply. We really need to do something more to maintain our position. Um, it's, obviously, it's obvious that it's really hard um, to understand the scale and extent of corruption in New Zealand. It's something that's kept hidden. It's the same as fraud in that respect. And we can only truly know about the cases that have been uncovered. And one of the things that we know is that the cases uncovered represent a fraction of what exists, but there's really very little agreement about what exists, um, about how that fraction should be expressed. Is it a, do we see a third of the cases? Do we see a tenth? In, um, in the Five Eyes countries, it's generally accepted, for example, that about 5% of the government's budget is lost to fraud. And I'll talk a little bit about the overlap between fraud and corruption, but that's, you know, for New Zealand, that's maybe $2 billion a year of the budget. It's an extraordinary amount of money. Um, and if we can do something to stem the tide, that would be fantastic because it would mean that money would get to where it ought to go. Um, we've got insufficient linkages and consistency of action across anti-corruption and integrity efforts and, as I said before, economic growth in high-risk industries and countries, international trading partners. So, just very briefly, the difference between fraud and corruption, not much is my answer to that, um, but at common law, and I'll talk a little bit about our specific legislation um, later, Deceit is not required, so you don't need to deceive someone in order to defraud them. So in Scott and the Metropolitan Transport Trust, which is quite a seminal case um, in relation to fraud, uh, the employees of cinema owners agreed with the defendants to temporarily abstract, without permission of the cinema owners, a whole range of films. So you can imagine in those days, this is when, this is 1974, films are in those big canisters. Um, and the employees received payment for doing that, and the people who received them without the knowledge or consent of the owners copied them for their own purposes. So the, the owners didn't actually know that the films had been taken, but they had suffered loss because presumably people, w people who may have been their customers saw the films that had been pirated in effect by the, the defendants. So the court and in were, did tend to be at, at pains to say that loss had been caused to the cinema owners. Um, so we've got obtain a gain and cause a loss. But it's also potentially a case of economic imperilment, um, which have been uh, very much at the heart of two cases that we've run recently. Um, Emily Holdings, which I've forgotten the name, Ross and Wahipahana uh, were defendants and they've just been sentenced last week to four years each and also a case, um, Gang Wang, who was also called Hung Kwang, um, and a number of defendants, both of those, all of those defendants obtained mortgage monies from banks 
by misrepresenting the nature of the risk that the banks were taking on in providing the mortgages. So nothing was lost by the banks in either of those cases, but there were very significant sums of economic imperilment. So, and deflecting the public <coughs> officer from their duty is the fourth category of fraud which was recognised in Scott. Corruption, on the other hand, is abuse of entrusted power for private gain, and in both the private and public sectors, and that's recognised in New Zealand. That's the Transparency International definition, and um, it's the one I prefer because I think it covers all situations. There are a lot more technical definitions used by the um, various development banks and so on, but I think this one's actually um, the most appropriate. There's an enormous overlap between those two things. So if you have, for example, Joanne Harrison, who was at the Ministry of Transport and managed to take approximately $700,000, um, as a, a tier two public servant. Um, she used her position to manipulate the records of the Ministry of Transport in order to benefit herself. That falls clearly within abuse of entrusted power for private gain, but we prosecuted her for fraud. Um, some of the fraud offences here can be quite difficult to fit things into, so we have both avenues, and I think that that's appropriate. <coughs> so. I've managed to shuffle my slides here. New Zealand's, yeah, New Zealand's corruption experience. Um, I mentioned Joanne Harrison at the bottom there. Um, Auckland Transport was a division of the Auckland City Council who, um, in, within that, sorry, it wasn't Auckland Transport as a whole, a division of Auckland Transport received enormous benefits from a supplier. That included mobile phones, like iPhones, for all of the staff. They were taken out to lunches. They were given overseas trips. They weren't paid cash, um, not extensively. One of the person at the head of that section did get paid as a um, as a contractor on a regular basis, but um, he bought, there weren't bags, brown bags of cash. Um, again, we charged them with fraud, but they were using the, their positions to give this contract of money, uh, sorry, contracts for Auckland Transport. Wallace Tehuru was also an employee of the Waitangi Trust and he used his position to, um, uh, to defraud the trust of, uh, I can't remember, a significant sum of money. He's recently pleaded guilty. <coughs> Procurement fraud, which is a bit of the Auckland Transport thing, misappropriation of assets, undisclosed conflicts of interest and inappropriate gifts and favours. So that the inappropriate gifts and favours was Auckland Transport. One lunch that they went to cost $15,000 and finished at 9 o'clock at night. <laughs> it's a little bit hard to imagine how that was appropriate. So a lot of these things, uh, in fact, most of these things we prosecute as fraud. We do prosecute corruption offences, but there's an enormous overlap. So our legislative responses... Um, We've had the Organised Crime and Anti-Corruption Bill in 2015, which was in part the legislation introduced to allow us to ratify UNCAC. Um, it narrowed the circumstances where facilitation payments were appropriate um, and increased the penalties for <coughs> private sector corruption in the Secret Commissions Act, which were increased from two, um, two years to seven years imprisonment um, maximum. So I have shuffled these a little bit. So the public... Um, corruption is in the Crimes Act, basically. So we have a, a raft of offences there that include judicial corruption, but the, the fundamental one of um, bribing a public officer. And in the Secret Commissions Act, we have the equivalent of private sector corruption. Some of the other responses that I've noted up there, the vicarious liability for foreign bribery, there I'm referring to corporations. So interestingly, we have a real divergence in corporate liability for bribery in this country. Um, we sort of parachuted in a set of provisions relating to foreign bribery, so bribery of a foreign official, which included vicarious liability for companies. So a corporation can be convicted of um, foreign bribery if an employee acts within the scope of their responsibilities and make, pays a bribe. So that it's, it's not technically, it's not named as vicarious liability, but that's the effect of it. Whereas in domestic law, in order for a corporation to be responsible for a bribe, 
we still have the um, directing mind and will theory of corporate liability. So it's a real, it's a real dichotomy between the two. And um, one of the things we think is that that should be addressed. Um, the narrowing of the facilitation payments is something that's got us into quite a lot of hot water overseas. The OECD in particular don't like it. Um, so what we did was to um, create an exception where an act committed for the sole or primary purpose of ensuring or expediting performance by a government official or um, of routine government action is still <coughs> exempt. Very little is actually going to fit in with that. Um, you can't pay millions of dollars to someone to do something within the time they're supposed to do it. It's, it's unlikely. And if you do pay that, it's not going to be a facilitation payment. I'm not... I understand that the OECD would like a very purist approach to this, but I'm not sure that our position is really inconsistent. Um, future consideration, a definition of corruption would be good. At the present time, our Act defines a bribe as money, valuable consideration, office or employment, or any, oh sorry, office of employment, I think, or any benefit. Um, it's made an offence to pay the bribe by requiring that the bribe be corruptly given or offered, and there's no definition of corruptly. So I think it would make um, the legislation a lot clearer if we had a definition. Um, deferred prosecution agreements is something that we're also very interested in. Um, the United States has had deferred prosecution agreements probably 25 years or more, and they also have non-prosecution agreements, and those agreements are reached between the prosecutor and the, um, or, and in slash investigator in the UK's case, um, to settle with a corporation in return for their cooperation, which enables the prosecution of individuals. So um, <coughs> that's something that we would like to look at, but of course, there's no incentive for a corporation to cooperate, I would think, if you have the directing mind and will um, basis of liability because it's going to be very hard to incriminate the corporation anyway. But in the UK, that's despite them having the directing mind and will theory of liability, they've had quite a bit of success in getting cooperation um, under their deferred prosecution um, regime. And modernising the offence regime in the Crimes Act, my personal preference would be to modernise it so that it represented the four varieties of fraud um, but at the moment we have a whole menu of different things which don't really co effectively cover the field. So the SFOU section 220, which is um, <coughs> something that I'm no now going to forget, theft by person in a special relationship for a lot of the financial companies that were in trouble after the GFC. So we had to shoehorn um, a whole lot of offences into that. And I think ideally we need to move some way towards ensuring that the offences are more modern and will cover the you know, financial transactions that exist today. Let's see what we've got next. Oh, so system responses. Um, the <coughs> SFO has recently had cab received cabinet approval for the commencement of a work program, um, an anti-corruption work program. So this is um, not investigation and prosecution. This is what can we do to ensure that we strengthen our regime and stay ahead. Um, it includes development, developing a shared understanding of corruption and the specific vulnerabilities in New Zealand, uh, local government procurement, which we know from our own experience is a, is a difficult area, international threats and risks, public funding allocation. So there's a lot of work being done elsewhere looking at public funding. And in the UK, for example, it's um, each government department has to declare and report each year how much fraud has occurred on their department. And if you don't um, declare anything, you're considered not to be doing your job. Whereas here, interestingly, um, when Joanne Harrison's case came to light, what we did was to vilify the chief executive who reported it, which I think is a really counterproductive thing to do. Um, what chief executive would want to report fraud ha having seen um, that experience, Martin Matthews' experience? Um, in the UK, that's celebrated if you find it, because that's good, we can stop it, we can learn from it and we can change practices. But I think it's fair to say that most of the chief executives said to me at that time, there but for the grace of God go I. 
because, you know, Joanne Harrison, for example, there were, you might have seen in the news, there were reports about Joanne Harrison, but she, um, she was a highly trusted um, employee. She was considered to be the best performer in the senior leadership team of the Ministry of Transport. There are all sorts of reasons why she would be trusted and, and that's what we're all doing every day. We know that, um, that you're a, a person who would um, pick up $20 if I dropped it and give it back to me, so why wouldn't I trust you with something else? Or you're good at your job, so why don't I trust you to do everything in your job well? Um, I think it's a very human reaction and it's quite unfortunate that we took that approach and it's something I've talked a little bit about um, in government as well. Probably not directly about corruption, but yeah. Um, we want to measure the value of prevention efforts. Um, we think that that's really important too because it, it's, there's that $2 billion there and if we can talk about how much of that we've saved, that would be fantastic. Um, and some private sector outreach. And again, modernisation of the relevant legislation. So that's the end from me. Thank you very much for listening. Um, <laughs> To the extent that I haven't talked about corruption, please feel free to ask questions later. And I'll just, just hand over to Tim. That's probably the only time the microphone's really Thank you, Tim. Martin, Martin, sorry. We've called many things. Tim's not the worst. Am I coming through the mic? Perfect. Thank you. Good. Um, that's very interesting. I really like that public works program. I wasn't aware of most of that. Um, my name's Marty. I, um, I come from SFO London for about six or seven years doing uh, the sort of work that Julie's done, but obviously at a lower level, investigating lawyer level. Um, I've spent some time at the DIA, which is the, um, the main regulator in the anti-money laundering space, and so we may get to that. Um, I've always been a little bit uh, sort of prosecutor, uh, prosecutorial in my thinking. I, um, when I was about four, told my mum, what do you want to be, Marty? Police dog. <laughs> didn't recognise that that wasn't a concept that you could do. Um, so I think it's always been in there and um, I've spent probably more years prosecuting than defending but I, I like the, the court litigation work. Um, so that's, that's my background. Um, fell into the AML um, consultancy that I do now as a lawyer um, having worked at the uh, AML um, with the AML team at the DIA and prior to that I was more into the, um, the fraud prosecution with the Crown Solicitor in Christchurch, uh, the SFR in London. Um, but I've really enjoyed the AML stuff, so I'll give you a bit more about that. I'm going to set my timer for 18 minutes. That's what I give my kids, six minutes each, stories, otherwise bedtime. Um, and if I, haven't, <laughs> if I haven't by then got on to the AML Act, I will. So, um, look, the biggest problem for humanity, what would you say it was? A lot of people would say, it's just simply global warming, Marty. It's pretty obvious. Um, there's various other solutions to that question, um, but I'm going to suggest we flip the script for a moment and consider what's preventing humanity from transforming societies from nepotistic autocracies, such as Tim's home country, uh, into flourishing democracies, uh, where citizens feel heard, respected, and empowered to contribute to a fair, egalitarian society, such as perhaps New Zealand, judging by the stats we've seen. Uh, given the sort of international community that may be um, promoted if, if all the countries had that similar sort of approach, the Scandinavian model, the, the New Zealand model, um, wouldn't we come together uh, better to solve things like global warming? Wouldn't we start to listen and, and actually tackle the things that need to be tackled rather than sweeping them under the carpet and letting money
Neon designers are very lucky. Uh, in our country's governance is comparatively excellent, as you've seen on the uh, Transparency International Index. Um, we do very well, and there's a number of other indexes that I'll hopefully get to if uh, our children's time allows me. Um, but could we go backwards like America right now? That does concern me. Um, and how can democratic countries move forward towards liberal democracy or some other form of flourishing and fair, uh, fair society? It doesn't necessarily have to be democratic. Um, but an egalitarian society and whatever political form it takes. Corruption, I would say to you, is one of the biggest barriers to that, and it's extremely difficult to overcome. To build its own momentum. Money subverts processes in the US. Big funders of the Republicans pressure politicians uh, towards outcomes favourable to rich business owners or golf club owners or reality TV stars or real estate magnates who are President Sanders. Some of them fit within the same Venn diagram. <laughs> integrity, including financial integrity, is the powerful, uh, the potentially powerful cure to corruption. But leaders need to make commitments to reform, not just sign up to um, measures that don't then get domesticated and don't get pro-integrity movement typified by work being done by the OECD that you perhaps have some um, inkling of. Um, it seems to be gaining momentum, uh, relies on authentic and transparent and honest leaders, uh, and I think it's um, to be uh, to be applauded. Uh, trying to tackle corruption and promote integrity in the world as government and, and, and can governmental institutions. Integrity, of course, is like health. It's much easier and cheaper to maintain if it's taught and integrated at the outset. Uh, and if it's included in the design of your laws, your policies, your institutions, then it's uh, much more likely to take root and reign. It's much harder, like health, to cure corruption later and much more expensive. It seems an impossible task to transform. leaders like I would say, I, I quite like Christina personally, and I think she does have the wisdom to be in the heart of the right place and wants to move in the right direction, and, and I applaud her. Um, I, I do, um, do know how the Labour vote, so I wouldn't go that long way. Um, but governance, I think, is a really important concept, and let me just talk to you a little bit about what governance means at a, a national level. It's really how authority is exercised in a country. What institutions and traditions exist uh, in a particular country to achieve the exercise of authority in a constructive and stable way. Think about the processes by which governments are selected, how they're monitored, free press, political checks and balances, oversight bodies, etc. How are the governments replaced? Is it smooth? Is there a coup? Uh, are the policies, uh, are the rules and institutions around that, are they mature and developed? Um, or, or are they none? Or are they, are they messy? What's the capacity of the government to formulate and implement sound policy effectively? Think about the institutions that govern economic and social interactions among citizens and groups in society, and are those institutions respected by the citizens? An important question for Tim. Um, are these institutions respected by those in power? Certainly not in the US at the moment. Stephen Colbert, um, hands up who doesn't know Stephen Colbert. <laughs> Pretty good showing. Stephen Colbert recently quipped um, that Trump had real difficulties with the Department of Justice, <coughs> mainly the Justice Department. <laughs> <laughs> But in New Zealand, we value justice, we value it heavily. Uh, fairness, equality, transparency. Um, although, of course, not 89 out of 100, we haven't always managed a, um, a perfect record, but we certainly sit at the top of, of most indexes. If the dirty politics scandal is perhaps, perhaps the worst we've seen in the, in the recent few years, um, then we're in a far better place than um, most of the world and, and Trump's America at the moment, at least until the November midterms hopefully act as a belated step on unrestrained abuse of liberal democratic norms, my hope. Um, various indices highlight just how far we are above other countries in, in terms of our governance. We've dealt with the transparency of the national corruption perception business, but I just know it's just based on perceptions and that's possibly an important point. Um, we can't really measure these things uh, very clearly. Corruption and money laundering, um, they hide, that's the very nature. So economists can try and value uh, all of the assets and liabilities in countries and World and try and balance those, they don't balance. There's a black hole, um, and they say, well, there's our corruption, our fraud, our, our money laundering. Um, but it's always a bit of a, a bit of a guess sort of business. Um, and so
some uh, commentators have said the results are really a rounding error and, and nobody can really be sure. But um, New Zealand Police, the Financial Intelligence Unit, um, which is in, uh, deals with the money laundering risk that they receive with the suspicious activity reports, they calculate about 1.35 billion a year. deal with the world governance indicators. Um, and if you want to look these up, uh, they're quite interactive. There's little tables and graphs, and I find them quite fun. I'm a little bit of a geek, but you might also, if you're on a geek scale, um, find them interesting. They um, are on info.worldbank.org, if you wish to have a look. Uh, and they score countries on a percentile rank, so from 0 to 100. So unlike the PI, if you don't keep paying your eye, you actually get 100 if you're the best in the world. Um, so they sound a bit different. But they have measures of voice and accountability, political stability, access to violence and terrorism, government effectiveness, regulatory quality, rule of law, and control of corruption, which is perhaps the most important for tonight. But let me give you, uh, just to stroke our own ego as a country, let me give you a flavor. Voice and accountability measures the perceptions of how far a country's citizens can participate in selecting a government, freedom of expression, freedom of association, and free press. Um, Norway, Sweden, 100. New Zealand, Netherlands, 99. Second, but close. <coughs> Political stability and absence of violence and terrorism. Monaco, Greenland, 100. New Zealand, Singapore, 99. So we're still really up there. Scandinavia, for some reason, fallen a little bit behind on the um, Just to give you some other numbers to give you context. Libya, 3. Iraq, 2. Lebanon, 9. Kenya, 13. Netherlands, only 80. So we, we beat the Dutchies quite well on this one. And Namibia, 69. Russia, 21. Moving on to government effectiveness, which we would think we do pretty well on. And this deals with the perception of the quality of public services. And we're very proud of our civil, uh, civil service here. And the degree of independence from political pressures, and uh, Jane may have a different view than, uh, than I just discussed. Um, the quality of policy formulation and implementation, and the credibility of the government's commitment to such policies. And here, Switzerland and Singapore scored the best 100. Norway, 99. Finland, 98. We fall way down to 95. Um, Germany, 94. US, 93. Doing quite well. Um, interesting the Korea. South Korea, 82. North Korea, 4. Uh, perceptions, though, in the US, I, ha I have to suggest um, at the federal level, at least, have dropped since scoring 93 in the 2017 <coughs> most recent data. Um, and perhaps quite far away. The next measure is regulatory quality. Uh, which deals with the perception about uh, the ability of a government to formulate and implement sound policies and regulations that permit and promote private sector development. Here we come very high as well with the Dutchies 99. Hong Kong scores the perfect 100. Canada, Switzerland, Germany, uh, all pretty high. Scandinavians, low to mid 90s. So, uh, penultimate is the rule of law index, which is uh, measuring the perceptions of the index. Uh, sorry. Perceptions of the extent to which agents have confidence in and abide by the rules of society, agents meaning us, the businesses, um, and in particular, the quality of contract enforcement, property rights, the police, the courts, uh, as well as the likelihood of uh, violence and crime and things of that nature. And here we do well as, again, 98, but we're behind Norway and Finland, not a perfect country. Um, Russia, interestingly, down to 22. China, 45, uh, on the improve. India, 53 and North Korea and Iraq on four each. And finally, the control of corruption index, which is most pertinent for tonight. This measures the perception uh, of the extent to which public power is exercised for private gain, including both petty and grand forms of corruption, <coughs> as well as the capture of the state by elites and private interests. And I was thinking Donald J. something again. Um, so here we have 100, we do really well. Um, Norway, 100 as well. We've been 100 since 2009. So in terms of our control of corruption on this index, we're, we're treated very well. Uh, again, the Scandinavians are high. Switzerland, Canada do well. UK and Germany <coughs> fall in the 90s. US is at 89, as it was in 2017 on 2016 data. But again, I suggest that it's uh, probably taken a bit of a battering uh, over recent times.
as fast as the world's international institutions try and solve uh, the, the problems around corruption, it's the commonly received wisdom, at least, and I think it's probably uh, bang on, that criminals will simply continue to invent new ways of subverting the systems put in place. We certainly see that in money laundering, and the typologies and methods of, of money laundering are constantly shifting, and the police have to put out documentation um, they do it quarterly and deal with new typologies and, and new issues that um, have to be grappled with. And businesses under the new anti-money laundering regime have to constantly read that stuff. Um, they have to have an anti-money laundering um, compliance officer who has to be alive to all the issues, update the risk assessment that measures the, the risk in the business, the risk that's being exploited by money launderers or terrorist financiers, and um, yeah, update the documents and the compliance program that governs how they do things to make sure we're taking into account all these changes that keep happening. Um, also, of course, you've got new technologies dropping into their laps. Um, with uh, new ability to solve more problems, but also circumvent regulation and circumvent law enforcement scrutiny. Uh, new technologies like, like cryptocurrencies and especially privacy coins uh, are in particular um, constantly blamed, and perhaps rightly, perhaps unfairly, uh, for making money laundering much easier to get away with, um, and hence corruption. And privacy coins, as um, you probably all know, uh, they're much more resistant to being traced to the owner's identity than is the case with most cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin or Ethereum, which are sort of, uh, effectively chips into stone in the blockchain or, or other distributed ledger technologies. And law enforcement quite likes that because often once they can prove who owns the particular bit of currency or token, they can trace back the time and they can watch as things happen going forward. Whereas um, with the privacy coins and the technology called mixes, you may be aware of these, it's like a tumbling around mixer thing that puts money in lost the ability to put the earmarking on it. Um, the privacy coins, you, you can't at the moment trace those. I'm not okay say with the um, computer technology, but I understand um, they're getting a lot of criticism for the reason that law enforcement won't be able to deal with them in the same way. <coughs> it's the scrambling of the audit trail with those mixes and the privacy coins. Um, that's a, uh, a very unexpected new bit of technology for enabling um, payment in tokens of value. And if you asked money launderers 15 years ago or even someone in five years ago, uh, they would have had no idea that such strange new inventions were going to exist to, to help them with their trades. Um, and in the, in, the, in the dark net, as you'll be aware, uh, a lot of this stuff happens. And these new technologies provide pretty rich opportunities for criminals to come together learn, join forces, access each other's illicit products and services, whether that be drug sales, illicit trial sex abuse material, of which I was a prosecutor for, for two and a half years at CIA, and um, that's a pretty grisly uh, enterprise. Um, there's extortion services, hacking, phishing, <coughs> I understand even paid assassination services if you want them, whatever you need. Uh, and to tell everybody this, Julie, really I don't expect to be prosecuted for aiding and abetting their future crimes, but um, one never knows. Um, I'm sure you're aware of these sorts of things. Uh, the criminal activities in the dark net yield the proceeds of numerous of these crime types, um, and these will need to be this, this proceed, these proceeds need to be laundered so they can be used safely by their owners. Happily, both fraud enabling services and money laundering services are available in the uh, dark web to help you. Uh, the technology is often associated with using the dark web, including these anonymity enabling devices, um, are the bane of the so what's money laundering and what is New Zealand doing about it? Of this? Um, <coughs> My apologies. So money laundering and terrorist financing definitions, I'll start with those. Money laundering describes a variety of techniques that are used by criminals to defeat law enforcers effectively by converting the proceeds of their criminal endeavours into usable assets or cash uh, or electronic funds or other value, cryptocurrencies and so forth, that have been cleaned of any trace of the original crime, which is to say they've had the audit trail um, effectively stretched to the point of breaking, uh, obfuscated to death. Money laundering is described as having three overlapping phases, which are placement, layering and integration, which are concepts that you really don't need to know because they're pretty simple when you hear how they, how they work. Placement really just means placing proceeds into a legitimate financial plate. Uh, final story. 
Um, for example, taking cash from illegal drug sales and co-mingling that with legitimate business practices. The first port of call there is the, is the legitimate financial system. Uh, another example might be receiving fraudulent tax refunds uh, and splitting it up into separate bank accounts when you get it back from the revenue. Uh, criminals often use professionals as unwitting uh, conduits to help place criminal proceeds into the legitimate economy, so uh, lawyers, accountants, and uh, real estate agents are being hit um, in a phased response by the, um, the government through the BIA as the supervisor of Australia. In July just gone, lawyers, um, Monday this week, um, accountants, and then 1st of January, real estate agents come in as well. There's not as high value lawyers that are racing to work in all the other new entities dragged under. It started off with financial institutions and casinos, and financial institutions in very broad term, meaning sure banks, insurers, and so forth, but also money remitters and people who do factoring, which is buying old debt and trying to try and make some money on renting it, and all sorts of various weird things that you wouldn't expect to fall under the definition of financial institution. Um, but it's covered around 2,700, which is quite a lot when you think there's only a few banks. Uh, 2,000 businesses are correct, and it's going to go up to about 8,000, 9,000. So it's a lot of businesses now coming under uh, pretty heavy compliance cost and control by the government who are basically co-opting us all, um, all the reporting entities under the Act anyway, to be their eyes and ears and to report things that, that may be suspicious um, and to help the government try to clean up um, the sector and make sure money laundering doesn't support businesses to the extent it, it perhaps used to. Now, sorry, back to the second thing. So we've placed it by just taking cash and putting it somewhere or getting it out of the revenue or whatever it might be. Um, second phase means uh, is layering, which simply means doing that over and over and over and over again. This is the, um, the washing machine where money laundering as a analogy comes from. Um, so making further transactions, conversions, movements of the illicit funds to confuse any forensic accountant later trying to piece the trail back together. Um, an example of this might be moving funds through multiple accounts, um, breaking it up, which is called structuring into little bits. Um, when you send it around, it's quite a nice term for this, you can send it around with a whole lot of dudes with cash strapped to the legs going through airports and into different banks and trying to break it up and bring it back together at the, at the, at the end where the ultimate beneficial owner, i.e. criminal, can then use it and get a house in the cave. And that's called smurfing. I think because these little guys, you can see them as <laughs> pretty blue, they wander around, they come back and Papa Smurf's got his, his, his uh, pad in the cave. Um, there's also something called cuckoo smurfing, but I won't bore you with that. But there's, there's some pretty arcane weird and wonderful terms in, in this area, which is goddamn useful because it's been boring times. <laughs> um, which is why I centre my money laundering uh, legal career with uh, some criminal litigation that I'm still a little bit of the, 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 the gory reality of uh, daily life for domestic violence, drugs and rape. Uh, uh, coming back away from that, um, an example of uh, layering will be uh, moving mon money through multiple accounts, as I said, or through companies, through trust, which is particularly effective because they're, they're much more difficult to pierce and understand what's going on. In a lot of cases, you can have companies nested um, where the ultimate beneficial owner might be five or six layers up, and it's really hard to find. Um, and so the reporting entities under the Act now have to try and um, clear the fog, understand who all the others are, and, and describe who the ultimate beneficial owners are. Um, and if enhanced due diligence is triggered, i.e. there's some risk factor that's higher than needed, then you need to ask that beneficial owner, or in some cases, several of them, what's your source of wealth, madam? What's your source of funds, sir? I need evidence of this. I need third-party documentation. I need enough to make me, on a risk-based approach, comfortable that I know who you are, and not on a, some sort of sanctions list or a politically exposed person, um, which might be um, somebody with uh, political exposure at a high level in the last 12 months in a foreign jurisdiction, say the finance minister from Jim Blatty turns up, uh, tries to do a deal through my law firm, um, I find he pops up on a, a check as a politically exposed person. I'm now prompted to say, all right, I know who you are. We need to have a little, little bit of a chat before I do business with you, sir. Um, so professionals are often used, and this is something that the Financial Action Task Force is, um, is trying to press as a new phase of, of reforms. Financial institutions have been covered around a lot of the world for many years. Um, since 1996 is when all this stuff came up. And when the Twin Towers fell in 2001 is when terrorist financing got brought in as well. Um, so it's been around for a while, but lawyers, accountants, and real estate agents are the primary three um, new business groups that are being
being caught in this regime now in Guinea. And uh, we're now in, in kicking with this regime to the real truest uh, in this area. Most um, countries don't have those um, because the gaps keep them proficient because they, they simply keep the gaps within the general financial institutions that allow you to um, create a company, then create a trust, then mix it, milk things around, and then throw your money in, throw it around the, 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 um, the washing machine for a while, and it pops out into the other state or some investment over there. And obviously lawyers who are going to form a company or a trust for you, or accountants will do the same, trust and accountant service providers will do the same. They're all medium to high risk as, uh, as voted by the BIA, who have set up a serious limited risk of these entities that are now ruled under the regime. So these ones are medium high. Um, there's not many that are high, maybe the letters offshore are high. Um, most are medium to low. So the new entities that are coming under the regime are actually the more risky ones according to the Financial Action Task Force and the and the domestic regulators. I digress. Back to the third phase. Um, this is called integration. So you've placed your money in, you've layered it around, and now integration really just means it is now integrated to the point where I feel comfortable as a criminal, flaunting my ill-gotten gains in a way that no forensic accountant is going to test that structure to find out that it's uh, actually taken from my methamphetamine sales to the trade. Uh, that's effectively what we're trying to do, get to the place where you've integrated it and you can now use it. <coughs> none, of these, none of these are wiser. You might reinvest it into illicit business, you might reinvest it into good business. Um, the business might buy a, a shop on the high street and you're, you're clean for now because you've got a few million, you don't need to, to worry about um, getting any more money. You've, you've done your deal, you're good. Criminals are affected by that, of course, because if you're greedy, you're greedy, you stay greedy. Um, but a lot of it does get used for legitimate businesses because that's the way, say, you come into New Zealand, you buy some nice real estate in a stable, um, democratic environment where nobody from the state is going to try and um, divest you of those assets because in some countries that will happen. Here, no, no way. Um, and you get a, a bit of legitimate business going, and if you want, some of the business too. So it's really up to us and the businesses that come under the regime to try and find this stuff and reform it to the police before they get to the point of integration. So the AMO laws have been implemented. Um, I have the very good fortune of Lexus at the same going to write a book on it, which is uh, uh, remarkable, really. Um, so take me to do that. Uh, but it was a, a pleasure to do, and it deals with, uh, it's a, really a practitioner's guide on practically how you can provide a Business. It could be your own law firm, but generally somebody comes to you, I've got a factor in the business, um, I need a risk assessment, I need to assess the risks of money laundering impacting my business, and I need to then uh, design a compliance program that sets in place how I do my customer due diligence, my know your customer checkup. KYC is probably the firm's name, CBD is what we call it in New Zealand. Once you get them through the door, you've got to check that um, you understand where they come from, you get uh, name, date of birth, information, you verify, you verify that against a couple of independent sources. That might be the BIA's citizenship groups or birth, birth death marriages. Um, if they're from offshore, then you're going to use similar ways of checking who they are. Um, they would exhibit certain high risk factors if they're a trust, for example, um, if they have a politically exposed person, if they try and do um, wire transfers uh, offshore over $1,000. These are the sorts of things that trigger you to go, okay, right, we're dealing with something serious here. We need to now apply enhanced due diligence on them. Um, so they call that EDD. The acronyms are coming out of your ears uh, in this new regime. The worst is designated non-financial business institution, DNSBP. Um, but there's a lot of uh, second contenders. Um, so, uh, it's, I guess it's like a, a lot of new regimes. But the New Zealand domestic um, situation is all designed from a centralised best practice that the Financial Action Task Force, um, a pan-government body uh, uh, <coughs> introduced by the G7 in 96. Um, they introduced best practice and they have a naming and chain routine whereby you get blacklisted if you're not following uh, what needs to happen. And um, to the extent New Zealand's been on a, a watch list, not a blacklist, we've had to up our game. So just to highlight for you how that's, how that's occurred, Perhaps even see if I can even give you dates. Yes, 2003, Cathay has assessed New Zealand's anti-money laundering systems to the extent we had them at that time and found significant gaps across pretty pivotal areas in how we regulate this stuff. Uh, conducting customer due diligence, not good. Record keeping, not good. Implementing
implementing compliance programs in North Korea. I mean, these are almost non existent, frankly. And the government's quality of supervision over the financial sector, not good. These are heavy hitting, need to do things. So New Zealand was placed in a regular follow up process to uh, monitor our efforts, which is the name of the chain of the thing. The Paddy's are excellent at this, and they've got um, most of the world's countries, towards 200 territories or countries, are now at least in some way complying or implementing domestic legislation. There's only 11 on the um, AML deficient list. Um, these are the North Koreans and the Iranians and the Iraqis. Venezuela, I think, is there. Sri Lanka, strangely. Sri Lanka actually ranks pretty high, other than being on this 11 persona non grata list. Um, but if there's only 11 in the world that really are struggling to do this stuff, it shows you how well the Catholics have done to get everyone corralled and to say, look, we don't play ball here. Um, foreign investment's going to dry up. Your reputation's going to dry up. People won't trust you as a country to have the integrity of your financial, um, financial working. So it's really worked very well. Um, and there's been um, an unusually aggressive approach in, in, that, um, um, in the way that um, these things are done internationally, but very effective. So we upped our game in a further facet. They call these things mutual evaluations. People come from different regimes um, who work in the, um, in the area of uh, uh, anti-money laundering in their own country. Experts from, say, the DIA equivalent will come over and they'll, they'll look into what the country's doing and give it a rating and then find problems. So we did the mutual evaluation in 2009. There'll be another one in 2020, by the way, so we're, we're starting to look pretty good for that. Uh, 2009, FATF found even after the improvements, New Zealand still failed to comply in a meaningful way for it all with 24 <coughs> out of 49 recommendations. So we're about half, even after we've tried to get this stuff sorted. <coughs> we were rated as compliant with 8 out of 49 recommendations, largely compliant with another 17, which means for the other 24, we were either non compliant or partially compliant, which means pretty good. So, in 2009, the government responded to the FATF criticisms in the form of the Anti-Money Laundering and Countering uh, Financing of Terrorism Bill, which was a title we considered, but was rejected. <laughs> Not a mouthful. Um, and the initial briefing to the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Select Committee, committee um, had the Ministry of Justice saying this. Money laundering and terrorist financing undermine the economy and create instability in the financial sector. Unchecked, money laundering promotes crime and terrorism and would highlight New Zealand as a weak link internationally, making our economy more attractive to money launderers and terrorist financiers. This would in turn make our economy less attractive to legitimate investors. Continued non compliance could also result in increased costs of overseas borrowing for the government and private sectors, as overseas lenders face a, a greater risk premium on non compliant countries over time. As a small independent country, but one with a wide range of international interests, New Zealand relies on diplomacy as its main vehicle for ensuring an external environment that is stable and rules-based, and for opening up opportunities to pursue our trade interests and other objectives. Compliance with FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, uh, would also support New Zealand's reputation as a country strongly committed to counter-terrorism, particularly in the eyes of key FATF players such as the United States. And accordingly, our interventions on counter-terrorism matters in regional and international fora would be enhanced. So as I say, I'll cut the end because I think we're probably there. Um, the most important obligation is now placed on businesses, and as I say, there's eight or nine thousand by the time we get to some of these. Um, they are customer due diligence, both at the outset, when you're onboarding, a horrible term, um, garnering a new client. Is it quite just American, or is it quite American? Um, if you're onboarding your clients, you've got a customer due diligence to check them. And during the business, business relationship, you need to keep monitoring them for any increased risk Generally, it might be they start accessing another service you have, such as forming a trust or forming lease with companies where you think, you know, I'm probably exposed here to the risk of money laundering. You don't have to see it. Most of the time, it won't be seen. All of this stuff is, is largely invisible. But if it ticks certain boxes in your compliance program to say, look, if this happens, people start spending over 500000 on particular things, if they have five levels of listed companies, if they have um, uh, politically exposed persons as beneficial. <coughs> beneficial owners somewhere in the background coming on board, then you've got to do more checking and you might have to get rid of them. It's just really difficult to lawyer because surfing a client, um, first of all, you've got a you know, certain duty to go and retain it, uh, but second of all, and if that's a device to all the, all the entities, you can't tip 
them off and you're going to make them suspicious and they clearly report that to the cops. But, so if you think they are doing something that's highly devious, you can't actually search them. The cops, well, you can, but you've got to be very careful when you do it. And you've got to make sure that you're not giving them any indication that you think their, their activities or, or services or transactions are um, suspicious or as effective to the cops. Um, and for the lawyers in the room, um, which will be most of you, um, this is obviously really tricky um, in terms of what we're used to is they tell me stuff, I observe that stuff, I don't tell no one that stuff, and I tell them anything I learn about their case that they need to know, regardless. Uh, as long as it's relevant to them, I will tell them. All of a sudden, you put in a position now of, God, I've got this really difficult meeting with this guy, and I can't tell him I'm considering a suspicious activity report, I know all this stuff about his background, and I've done it through my due diligence checking. How am I going to run this relationship? It's a really tricky situation. Also, privilege is a, is a nuisance when you want to report something suspicious. If you're happy as a lawyer to be reporting all this stuff that you normally never would, um, then you've got to get back to the privilege stuff. Privilege is hard out for that. It doesn't include anything going through the trust account. It all gets very complex and it's very unusual for lawyers and accountants in particular to be dealing with this stuff. Um, so, an interesting new way of doing it. Along with customer due diligence, uh, reporting suspicious transactions. These are the main things that you should be using to do in the regime. And as I say, asking for a source of wealth and source of funds and independently verifying that information. These are the main things that people need to be able to do. Um, that's pretty much the good coverage, I think. And I'm probably out of time, so I'll stop there. And very happy to answer any questions if anyone wants to ask me today. Oh, we're not? Then that's, if you don't want to, that's fine. Yeah. 